both the times that I was shot down, it was just either hydraulics were knocked out, and uh, one time we took a hit. I looked out the door and I could see fuel flying in the air underneath it, coming up from under the aircraft. And I just I looked up at the fuel gauge and you could actually see it moving down. And I saw the pilots, I said, we need to get this on the ground. I says, we're losing fuel. And I says, let's don't have a spark. I says, because it's, I saw our whole tail soaked in fuel. And we were able to get it just over the fence of a friendly, of a friendly unit and set it on the ground. And as soon as he touched the skins on the ground, everything shut down. We fixed the crossover rod, put a, new, uh, put a patch on it, and filled them back up with fuel and flew it home. Everybody got shot up. It was the normal thing. I've always felt that it's my duty and my responsibility to serve this country. I've been involved with the military basically my whole life. I was in military school in the third grade. It's probably the reason why I joined the Army right out of high school was the fact that I, could, I still could remember back to when I was in the military school. And the discipline didn't bother me, and the regimentation didn't bother me. In fact, I liked it. And so when I went into the Army for six years, I had no problem with, uh, with authority or making things work that had to, had to work and doing the job that I had to do. Why did you join the military and why the Army? Probably because I was bored. I just wasn't, I, I guess I wasn't challenged. I never wanted to be a Marine. That was never my thing. Um, and uh, I could not envision spending six months a year out on a boat with 5,000 men in the middle of the water. I uh, went to the Army and uh, took, took their entry exam and they were more than thrilled to get me. Because of the Cold War and how the military was building up, they were looking for people to go into their mechanized units, armor. So I just took armor over infantry. Two easiest jobs to learn is how to be a loader and how to be a driver. And so uh, I ended up driving a tank. It was a serious possibility of us going to war with the Soviet Union back in that day. The military decided that they were going to do pre-positioning of equipment in different parts of the world. And the 2nd Armored Division uh, was going to be in Europe if the Soviet Union ever came across the demilitarized eye zone and came in and started, we started a war. And in 1963, they airlifted the whole 2nd Armored Division to Germany. When I got it, when I finished my first enlistment, I re-enlisted. I knew that that wasn't where I wanted to spend the rest of my life, in a tank. But aviation was starting to, to come around in 1964. And so I went to, uh, to Fort, Rucker, or Fort Rucker, Alabama and went through uh, the aviation school for mechanics. And I learned how to, to be a, 
mechanic on a CH-34. When I got through school, then I was assigned to the, went to the aviation unit with the 4th Armored Division in Germany. Was there for almost a year. And then I got orders for Vietnam. And everything changed. Yes. Yes, everything changed. Yeah, and you're all, yeah. Got to Vietnam and uh, got assigned to an aviation company. Actually, I was with the uh, 335th Assault Helicopter Company, which was, a, we were the support for the 173rd Airborne Brigade. I had been trained through school on a CH-34. I got off the truck and I took a look at the flight line and we had Hueys. And I said, wonderful, I've never worked on a Huey. <laughs> My job basically was to go out and repair the helicopters. I would be uh, repairing the hydraulics, um, helping track rotor blades, replacing re replacing main rotors if they if they got one damaged. One of the platoon sergeants came down and from the from the gun platoon and said he needed a crew chief. I had learned enough that I could crew one, and so I took the job on. The aircraft belongs to you. You're signed for it. You let the pilot fly it. He's also a door gunner, and he, but you've got a door gunner assigned to your aircraft, and his job is to take care of the weapons, the guns. Your job is to take care of the helicopter. Every mission is, uh, the potential is there to, be, to, uh, to not come out the other side uh, because somebody's shooting at you the whole time. You're sitting in the doorway, like with a big bullseye on your chest. So Charlie's, he has what he's shooting, he can see you. And that's what they're shooting at. I took 28 hits in an aircraft on, on, one, on one assault. We had 28 bullet holes in the airplane. Nobody got hit. The aircraft did, but nobody decided, none of us did. Everybody got shot up. I mean, it was, it was the normal thing. We went into an, an assault, and the Vietnamese had, the, had a 50, quad 50 they were shooting at us with. And 50 caliber bullets look like footballs when they're coming at you. The tracks are like huge, and they're, and they're glowing red. And you know that's only one of four. The pilot uh, flipped the controls. You could, he could control how many rockets he fired off each side and we went to shooting two pairs, so we were shooting four rockets at a time. And I just told him, don't miss, because we were going right down the throat of this 50. And he put all four of them right at the base and blew that thing in the air. You could hear the, the infantry guys on the ground cheering, because it, it had them pinned down for about, for about well, probably an hour or so. You can't let the fear of the situation affect what you do. You have to do your job. The fear comes afterwards. When you, you think back on, you know, that was close. <laughs> when we got back to the States, uh, that was rougher than going to Vietnam. They called me a warmonger. You know, nobody was, except family, who were glad to see you. And I tried not to let it emotionally affect me. And I, and I thought about, you know, should have I stayed? Would I made a difference? Would, it, would I, somebody not died because I was there? And, and that's your biggest thing is to, is to save lives. It's a thought that goes through your mind. You can't, you can't dwell on it because you left but it's the thought that you think about. I got out of the military in 67, had nothing to do with the military at all for almost 10 years. And a friend of mine came up and he had got into the reserves and he, and he came up and he says, he says, you ought to come down. 
and just take a look. I missed it. And uh, so I enlisted in the reserves. I was a drill sergeant for a while. I taught everything from basic marksmanship and weapons, and then I got into quartermaster. I'd hit 60 years old, and in the, in the reserve side of the house, they retire you at 60. Well, I still want to be active with something to do with the military. I have always felt that if a veteran passes away, they should always have military honors. And so I went back to the VFW. I asked them if they had an honor guard, and they said, yes, they did. Joined their honor guard, and I got deeply involved. We're on our way to Highland Baptist uh, in Redmond, Oregon. Uh, we have a uh, memorial service planned there for a veteran and uh, we just need to make sure that uh, everything is coordinated and organized. Okay. Did you, did you bring the urn with you too? Okay, we'll take the flag out of the case because the, the Navy will be here to unfold, present, refold, and give to you, okay? Whether they 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 fought they actually fought in a war or if they just supported the people who did, or if they were if they were in in between wars, it's because they were there and willing to put their life on the line for this country. This country is what it is. Give me one right here. Hey, line face right to the door, right right across here. Yep. They swore the door. To me, it's an honor to be on that honor guard and perform military honors for a veteran. Port Harms, half right, face. Ready, fire. Ready, fire. Ready, fire. Detail, recover. Present, arms. A lot of families, they understand some of the feelings that their sons or husbands or brothers have. When they see military honors done right, I've had them just walk up to me you know, in tears. I mean, it hits you right in the heart. You're thinking, you know, this is why we do this. That veteran's gone. It's for his family. We add to that tradition by presenting three shell casings representing the three volleys that we fired today. Those three volleys symbolize three words in every veteran holds close to their heart. That is duty, honor, country. Thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege to present military honors. Detail, can hut, half right, face. Ready, fire. Ready, fire. Ready, fire. Detail, recover, present, arms. When I hear the national anthem, I still get chills. When I see somebody disrespect the flag, it bothers me because I put my life on the line for that flag. In this world, there is no better place to live than right here. Till the day I pass away, I'm, I'm, always, gonna, I'm always gonna be looking that way about this country. <laughs>